So let's talk relative value trading. Pair trading and then dollar neutral trading. There is absolutely no difference between the three of these things. Okay? So that's important to know because there's so many buzzwords. These are absolutely synonymous. Now, what about delta neutral trading? That's going to be a little bit different because delta neutral trading is a way that option traders can really narrow down and focus on volatility. So that's going to be a little bit different. We'll probably get into a little bit of that, but this is really important because I want you to understand that these three, they're absolutely the same. But let me tell you how I got into this and why I think it's just such a practical way of approaching the markets. I think what you'll really find by the end is it's not that big of a difference from what you're already doing. It's just going to give you a lot more information on every single trade that you make. I got into the business in 97 and I got into the business trading NASDAQ futures. Okay, so NASDAQ futures and I traded them on the floor of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. Now, what's important to notice is floor traders do not gamble. Floor traders are always going to have what we're going to refer to as edge. And edge is what gives them an advantage, what makes them different. And it's really important for every single trade that we do, we need to have edge. And for that reason, and I say this to my clients often, I'm not trading Apple. Apple has 100 analysts following the darn thing. It's got 100 market makers. By definition, that makes it the most perfectly valued stock. Because the more volume, the more activity, the more people watching that given name, the better value. So we want to find edge. So as a NASDAQ futures trader, the NASDAQ futures are a derivative against the NASDAQ 100. And the NASDAQ 100 is just a basket of 100 technology stocks. Okay. So there's a basket and you have a hundred different technology stocks all in there with different weightings and all of those added up together. Once you put in the weightings equal the NASDAQ 100. Now the future, what the floor traders trade, the NASDAQ future, they trade at something called fair value and fair value is going to be mathematically, it's a pretty in-depth equation that we don't have to go through for this purpose, but I want to explain why relative value trading makes so much sense and why pros use relative value type trading. Fair value is saying with how much time the futures have until they expire, how much should they be trading over the basket of cash? So if we have the cash, which is NASDAQ cash and then the future. And let's say fair value is three. If the basket is trading 100 with equal supply and demand, the futures would be fair valued three dollars above. What the floor traders would do is knowing that fair value is three. If the futures, all of a sudden, somebody comes in and buys a thousand NASDAQ future contracts, what's going to happen to the futures price? It's going to go higher, right? 105, 107, 109. If it goes higher to 109, if someone buys that, does that mean the cash is going higher as well? Does that equate to someone just bought enough stock to rally that cash? I don't know. It's important to recognize that the markets trade on supply and demand. So if there's a big order to buy the futures at 103 and it goes to 109 and the cash doesn't move, well, naturally, that would make sense to sell 109 because you know definitively that cash is still at $100. And so therefore, you're selling the spread for nine dollars now jonathan how would you buy the nasdaq cash we wouldn't we wouldn't buy the nasdaq cash but we knew what the cash was trading at so if the futures rallied based upon supply and demand this becomes a very very 
high probability trade. So this is kind of the genesis of how I started thinking more of relative value. Because as a floor trader, we weren't just betting on the price at 103 going higher or lower, right? We would wait until big orders would come in, have the futures trade off value, and if it got down to 101, we would buy the future. If it got down to up to 107, we would sell the future as long as that basket of cash didn't move. Now, the same thing could happen if that basket of cash is trading 100 and then the futures trading 103. Let's say the futures are absolutely dead. There's nothing going on. They're just sleeping. But all of a sudden, a big hedge fund comes and buys Apple, like a whole bunch of Apple. So the cash might rally to 102. Now, if the cash rallies to 102 and the futures don't move, what would we do with the futures? We'd expect them to go higher, right? Because fair value would say the futures should be 105, not 103. So the floor traders would buy 103s with an expectation for that price to go to 105. So that's an overview. And again, you can't do this trade. This trade is no longer available because the edge has been taken all out of it. But this is what I traded from 1997 to 2003. All relative value, all pair trading. And it's still relative value, even though we're just doing one side of the trade and not necessarily the other side of the trade. This is professional trading. This is how traders look at it. After 2003, the NASDAQ, the edge was starting to, be, uh, to come out of the market. In 97, the NASDAQ went straight up. Then it went straight down to 03, and then it got real quiet. Over here, the trade just dried up. It was terrible. Nobody could make any money. I didn't know what I was going to do. I mean, it was, it was really, really a tough time because this was easy peasy, but this was very, very difficult. Traders need to go where the action is. Okay, This is where I learned the biggest lesson in my career, that when markets stop moving, when opportunity is lost, when you no longer have growth in your P&L, when your statement is no longer you know, <laughs> making more money, get out of Dodge. And that's when in 2003, I started trading bond futures. But again, I started trading bond futures as a relative value relationship. And here's how that worked. We have the bonds. And if we look at them as a yield curve, we have the two year, the five year, the 10 year, the 30 year, it's really an 18 year, and then the ultra. So these are duration, okay? Duration is how much time they have until those bonds expire. So a five year bond, five years until it expires. What we do in this trade and how it's relative value, pair trading, dollar neutral trading is instead of speculating on is the 10 year going to go up or is the 10 year going to go down? That makes no sense to me. To me, that's gambling. To me, there's just too much uncertainty. And for someone who does this for a living, <laughs> I'm not willing to do that. It makes no sense to me. What I want to do is I want to trade the difference between two instruments that are really, really close on the yield curve. Because if you think about it, if you put your common sense hat on, what's the big difference between five years and the 10 year bonds actually more of like a seven year future? What's the difference between the prices of these two instruments? Is it possible for the five year bond or note and the 10 year note to trade in completely opposite directions for years and years? Probably not, right? Because these two instruments have a correlation of like 80%. So overall, sure, they're not gonna move lockstep together. But overall, if the five year is gonna rally for five days in a row, I think it's pretty darn 
okay to say the 10 year is probably going to rally for four days in a row or five days in a row. But if this starts happening where the five years going one way and the 10 years going the other way, instead of placing a bet that the 10 year is going to go higher or the five years going to go lower, I don't want to do that. The way that I want to do it and the way that I was taught and it makes a ton of sense to me is I want to do a relationship trade where I want to buy one and sell the other. And it's the same thing as doing, you know, NASDAQ futures against NASDAQ cash. It's the same thing as doing wheat against wheat, right? Wheat, wheat, wheat's traded on Chicago at the Chicago Board Options Exchange. Actually, at the Chicago Board of Trade, excuse me. And it's also traded in Kansas City. So if we can look at the two relationships between wheat Chicago and wheat Kansas City, what's the big difference between those two, right? If this is what the charts look like, one versus the other, and all of a sudden one dips down here, is it safe to say that we could probably buy this one because we know that this wheat is not really moving, right? Does that, does that make sense to you? Because to me, it makes a ton of sense. And that's how I think about the market. But where people kind of get caught up, if they kind of dumb it down too much, is yeah, you can buy this wheat. You can sell this wheat. But that doesn't mean this necessarily needs to rally. Because this could obviously go down. So instead of just betting on one side, what I want to do is I want to take both sides of the trade. That makes a lot of sense to me. What we're looking for is we're looking for in the bond trade, little kinks in the yield curve. So if it looks like this. We're looking for, uh-oh, supply and demand really rallied this portion of the market. So therefore, we'd want to sell this portion and buy something else. And if we buy something else, that's where we're going to start dealing with highly correlated assets. And that's overall what we're looking for in these relative value trades. So we started off trading NASDAQ. I showed you exactly why the trades that we were looking for. Then bonds. Bonds is just a natural, natural relative value trade. Even what we started getting into was the U.S. yield curve against the German yield curve. Again, selling what's expensive, buying what's inexpensive, but never gambling, never just flipping a coin and guessing whether the 10 year is going to go higher or the 10 year is going to go lower. It makes a lot more sense. And that's why I want to walk you through all these examples just to show you kind of how it all started. Okay. Because any other trades that we make going forward are all going to be looked at as how can we tie it down? If the NASDAQ cash is here and the future is $3 away whenever it moves, we know that the future is not going to all of a sudden go $20 away because it's tied down, right? We know that the NASDAQ cash is here. Now, if it all of a sudden moves $20 away, sure, this could rally $15, fine. And this might not move, but that's why we want to do both sides of the trade. One more portion of my career that I'd like to go through because it also deals with relative value. In 2010, I left that bond firm. A year, I had a one year non-compete. So I got to do the Ironman, just spent a lot of time working out, ton of time with my family, it was fantastic. But that's when options were experiencing just exponential growth. So I became a market maker on the Chicago Board Options Exchange. Now, up until then, I had, I had options knowledge, but my options knowledge wasn't as strong as it needs to be because market makers need to be able to value options to the penny. And that's every single strike. You need to be able to value that stuff to a penny. So I had to learn. So I took six months. I learned with a professional market maker. I watched his position. I let him go play golf. I just hung out, tried to add as much value as I could so he would teach me the how to market make 
options. When you're market making options, you're also using that relative value approach. But then what we would do is if the VIX was at 11 and a given name, Microsoft was trading at a 30% volatility and let's say the VIX is not moving, well, we'd wanna find some volatility that was expensive, maybe historical for Microsoft was 25%. Well, maybe that 30 is expensive. But then to balance out our overall portfolio, we'd also wanna find some volatility that was inexpensive. So if GE like to hover around 20% and we can buy it for 15%, we're buying volatility on GE. We're selling it on Microsoft. Now, GE and Microsoft don't necessarily have a high correlation, but what does have a high correlation is the volatility of the overall market. So what we'd wanna do as market makers is trade a balanced portfolio, where sometimes we'd be selling ball, sometimes we'd be buying ball, but we were never really speculating on the direction of the VIX because we want to be able to profit in any market environment, whether the market's ripping higher, whether the market's going lower, whether volatility is exploding higher, whether volatility is exploding lower. So that's what we're looking to do. Not only volatility too, you also want long exposure on the overall market and short exposure on the overall market. The idea is don't guess. Don't bet, don't gamble. We wanna find highly correlated trades that make sense. Sometimes selling volatility, sometimes buying volatility, but overall, you know, if in, the, in the seesaw of life, we wanna have that nice balanced portfolio. And you can see here, I am a horrible, horrible artist. That's just terrible. But the idea is that's a seesaw and you wanna have balance. You don't wanna have just the market's definitely going down. The market's definitely going down. I'm all in on the short side. Uh-uh. Plenty of ways to bet. Plenty of ways to express that opinion in the overall market, which will go through. But if you think the market's going down 100%, you have no doubt, and you want to buy a whole bunch of puts in something, you still want to find something to buy to cover your upside. Because your opinion, as much as you might be a talented technician or whatever, even if your opinion is 75% chance we're going down, well, on that 25%, you wanna make sure that you're protected. The coolest thing in trading is when you get good and you can have a view and an opinion. If you're right, you can make a whole bunch of money, but if you're wrong, when you get really good, maybe you could even break even, maybe even make a little bit of money on the upside being dead wrong because you were right on movement and the market moved so much that little calls ended up paying off or whatever. That's what we're trying to get to. Have an opinion, put on some risk, put yourself in position to make a bunch of money. But if you're wrong, hey, live to trade another day. If you're wrong, your account pulls back, but it doesn't pull back enough that it annihilated the previous month or it toasted the last six months. That's not realistic that's not gonna give you longevity in the trade, okay? This sets it all up. I wanted to walk you through exactly how I learned this and why I'm always looking for these different relative value relationships. 